collaboration is something we all know is valuable and we know we get better results when we have it, but collaboration can be elusive and sometimes misunderstood when you, especially if you work on a remote or a hybrid team. Uh, that's why I'm excited for today's conversation. We're talking about how to build incredibly collaborative relationships at work. Welcome to another epi episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders grow personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you're listening to this podcast, you could have been with us live. Well, you can't turn back the clock, but you could be with us for future episodes live on your favorite social channel. Uh, you can get all of the information about that, find out when those live episodes happen, and more by joining our Facebook or LinkedIn groups, just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn or follow my channel on YouTube. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by our new book, The Long Distance Team, Designing a Team for Everyone's Success. You can learn more and get a excerpt by going to longdistanceteambook.com. That's longdistanceteambook.com. And now... I'm going to bring in our guest, and there she is. And let me introduce her for us all now. Her, her name is Dr. Deb Mashik. She is an experienced business advisor, professor, higher education administrator, and national nonprofit executive. She is the author of the new book, Collabor Hate, How to Build Incredible Collaborative Relationships at Work, Even If You'd Rather Work Alone. Named as one of the top 35 women in higher education by diverse issues in higher education. She has been featured in media outlets, including uh, MIT Sloan Management Review, The New York Times, The Atlantic, Reworked, Forbes, Fortune, Business Week, uh, University Business Insider, The Hill, and many others. Previously a full professor of social psychology at Harvey Mudd College, she is now the founder and principal of MyCo consulting where she applies relational science, excuse me, relationship science to help people collaborate better and much more. Uh, Deb, welcome. Thanks such for being pleasure. here. Yeah, so it's such a pleasure to have to you. Here, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, we did have a little challenge at the beginning and there we go. See, we are loud and clear in Egypt, clearly. Uh, so at least something's working, Deb. Um, hey, let's just start here. Uh, you didn't wake up. I often say this to people. You didn't wake up um, when you were seven and say, I'm going to be a relationship scientist. Um, <laughs> so what sort of led you to doing this kind of work? Uh, I mean, the backstory is actually really interesting. So I grew up in a double wide trailer in Western Nebraska. So it's a pretty rural community. And I point to one of my early influences on being interested in collaboration is the this very open courtyard of of the trailer park so it was a you know all these asphalt roads these empty parking or these empty uh, lots where trailers would sit on these tin sheds that were empty and us kids got to figure out together what we're going to play what the rules were going to be how we were going to enforce those rules keep other people you know so that they could contribute their ideas that they wouldn't go you know leave our leave our playground um but there weren't a ton of adults present telling us what to play, how to play it. Uh, they weren't intervening or mediating our disputes when they would kick up. And so as a kid, I learned how to get along and how to play well with others. And then, you know, the I don't know how much of this backstory you want, but I, through a, a fortunate series of adult mentorship relationships, found my way to college. That was not a given that I was going to necessarily go there. And then it was while I was at college, I met this professor who told me about this thing called graduate school. I decided to apply. And it was my very first seminar as a student at Stony Brook University, where I took the psychology of close relationships class. And I completely dorked out. I was the kiddo, or I guess I'm an adult at this point. I'm the person raising my hand. You know, I want to talk about everything. I did every stitch of reading assigned in that class. I just couldn't get enough of thinking about these ideas. And that's where I fell in love with the psychology of collaboration or with the psychology of relationships and then learned later as a professor how incredibly relevant these theories, these processes, these tools are to helping people work better together in the workplace. So we'll get to the relationship piece because it's one of the two big, I think, ideas of the book. Uh, but uh, before we do that, 
I mean, I opened by saying, hey, everyone knows collaboration is important kind of thing. And yet early, early in the book, you talk about the fact that there are, I think you called them sizzles and fizzles, but I, I really only want to talk about the positives. Like what are the benefits of collaboration? And you talked about it in four different areas. You, you said, hey, we have some, the team has some, the project has some, and the organization has some, but just maybe highlight for us a couple of collaborative benefits that we don't always think about or we don't associate with collaboration specifically. Yeah, so let's start with the uh, the self-interest side. So (laughs) when collaboration is going well, when we're involved in a collaboration that, you know, we feel we're able to bring our ideas in, it's it's fun, it's not stressful, it's not the thing we're taking home with us, uh, the data suggests that these high quality collaborations are associated with less anxiety, less depression, more satisfaction at work. What a great thing to have. Um, then to your point about how about the team and the project, what's it, what's at stake for them when this is going really well? You are able to bring in more diverse perspectives. You're able to leverage those perspectives to solve the tricky problems that, I mean, if, if a problem needs to be solved and it's obvious how to solve it, you don't really need collaboration. You just need someone to go in and do it. But most of the problems we encounter in the workplace, the, you know, the big challenges of the world, we need different perspectives, we need different functional areas, and it's through effective collaboration that we're really able to bring those to bear in the most leveraged way. And of course, for the organization, when you've got these incredible collaborators doing amazing things, you're getting products and ideas to market more quickly, you're reducing turnover, you're uh, you're having more innovation, you're attracting more market. So all of these, you know, like, bottom line, timeline issues that, of course, we're all driving toward. So I told you before we before we started that, um, you know, most folks here are leaders uh, that are that are watching us, listening to us. Um, and and yet we wear two hats. Well, we wear more, more than two hats, probably. But <clears throat> two of the hats we wear is, is we are leading teams, but we're also on teams. We are Uh, We are on the team we lead, but we're on other teams as well. So I really hope that as you're listening, everyone, uh, you think about this as an individual and not just thinking about this about other people, right? Like your team, like, what do I need to do for my team? We'll get there before we're done. But I think it's really important that we think about this for ourselves. Um, and, And Deb, I really love, to me, the big idea of the book is that there are these two factors that are the things that help us figure out how successful our collaboration is going to be or not, or if it leads to collaborate, as the the book title suggests. So I'd like, we'll get to the matrix eventually, um, but let's talk about the two factors first. What are the two pieces or the two dynamics that you think we need to be thinking about when it comes to collaboration? Yeah, actually, and if you don't mind, before I before I answer that, if I can pull back something else that you just said too about how all of us are on teams, whether we're at the leadership role or not, what's fascinating about that to me is very few of us have actually received any formal training in how to collaborate well, and so that means you know think about for the the leaders in the room today, how you know how much professional development have you actually spent? So I know we're supposed to play and get along well with others, but. Maybe, maybe if you went to an MBA program, um, this was covered a little bit, but even in MBA maybe. spaces, a lot of it, a lot of that training is focused on divide and conquer mentality, which is not actually collaboration. It's a way of you know dividing and conquering. And so what we end up in these leadership roles is people who need to be working together on the executive team, for instance, or who are mentoring and leading teams, but don't necessarily have the tools or even the vocabulary or the resources available to do it well. And so big surprise, it's often very frustrating, which is where that collaborate hate title comes from. So to your question about these two big factors that I, as a relationships researcher, am particularly enamored with, the first one is relationship quality, which is simply to what extent is this a positive or negative relationship? Do you you like collaborating with this other person? Do you feel you can trust them? Um, Are you committed to, to, to being with them in this regard? Do you value the kinds of contributions that other person can make? Do you respect them? Things like that. On the other dimension, the other factor is interdependence. And interdependence has to do with to what extent are your outcomes dependent on my actions and behaviors? 
and vice versa, to what extent are my outcomes dependent on what you do? So I mentioned I'm from Nebraska, so I like a good farm metaphor. Uh, the question I like to ask here is, is my wagon hitched to your ill-mannered horses? Are, do I believe that you're going to run me off a cliff? Is this, a, to use another metaphor, a sink or swim sort of situation where you're taking me down with you if you're not doing your stuff? Well, it depends on where the cliff is. It might lead you into the water. So you may still have sink. You could put those two <laughs> metaphors together, Deb. Uh, there, there's really that possibility, especially since you're just doing it in our head, right? Off the cliff into the river. Um, and I although, like the idea that- in Western Nebraska, there aren't many cliffs. In fact, I grew up in North Platte, which literally means flat river. So yes, I mean, it is very so flat. Very North flat. Platte. Yeah. Uh, there is a river, however, um, but you might not need to swim just saying, uh, yeah. in some areas. So uh, we will not continue on our geography lesson of Nebraska, um, but I, I want to talk about these two these two qualities, these two things a little bit, relationship quality and um, interdependence. And, and relationship quality, one of the things that you talk about, and I think all of us have experienced this, but I don't know if all of us have thought about this. I, I believe you called it um, a, a transaction-based relationship transactional relationship. Um, and so I think a lot of people, that's what we have at work. Um, and so what is that? And is that enough in terms of when you're talking about this, this quality of a relationship? Yeah. So in the book, I go over a handful of different strategies you can use to increase relationship quality. And one of them I call bring the donuts, which doesn't literally mean bring the donuts, though I do really, really love donuts. So it's not a bad idea if you're collaborating with me. But, exactly. but the idea is to be intentional about activating what we call communal norms. This is in contrast to what's called an exchange norm. So in an exchange okay, norm, it's more transactional tit for tat. Like, I do this, you do that, uh, you that we reciprocate kindnesses or uh, whatever the expected behaviors are. We reciprocate those in, in short order. That way there's you know not a time delay where I'm like, hey, is Kevin gonna drop the ball and leave me, you know, leave me flailing, that sort of thing. The contrast is in communal norms where I pitch in, I do nice things, I go above and beyond, not because I have to, not because I'm expecting you to do it in return, not because I think you'll do it in return tomorrow but because it improves somebody else's world a little bit in a way that um, strengthens the fabric of the relationships in the office, in the workplace. And it can, it doesn't even have to be project related. It could be. So it could be things like, you know what, let me take the first pass at that memo that we need to send out to the client. Or it could be non-work related, the workplace related, like, hey, I noticed Kevin keeps complaining about the squeaky wheel on his chair. I'm going to bring in a little bottle of WD-40 and fix it for him. Not because he asked me to, not because I'm annoyed by him or annoyed by the sound, but hey, it's right here. I could just do this little thing. Or it could be nice things like checking in and, you know, just saying like, hey, do you want to go grab a cup of coffee together and picking up the tab for somebody else? I, I think, I think that as a leader, uh, so first of all, that's, that, that idea of uh, of communal norms is useful to us, not just at work, but in the workplace. If I, as a leader of my team, want to sort of move that up the ladder a bit, if I want to, if I want to create those communal norms, if I want to be that person that does something without expecting something in return, my experience is that sometimes that's hard because people think you're you're just doing that because you're the boss. So which they might appreciate that you're a boss that thinks about that, but like, they're not really doing it. You know, they got a company credit card or whatever that might be. What, what are your thoughts about that? And do you have any advice for us as leaders around that? If, if our intention truly is to build that, but it, it only matters based on the perception of the other person anyway. Right. So like what's your take or your thoughts on what we can do as leaders to build that when we have that power differential? Yeah, so in any of these more cultural oriented things, or really what that would be, I would say is there's a leader who wants to establish a communal culture in the workplace. How do you do that? And you tend to need to answer five questions. So have you made this behavior possible? Have you made it easy? Have you made it normative? Have you made it rewarding? 
And have you made it required? Don't make communal stuff required. So let's just delete that one entirely from, from the possibility. But have you made it possible? Things like, do you have policies on place that says nobody can bring in outside food or something stupid like that? But also when you see it among your, so if you notice somebody doing something kind and generous for somebody else on the team, do you name it and celebrate it to help hold it up? It's like, this is something we do here. This is our standard operating approach. And also, do you um, reward it and not in a, hey, I saw you brought in the donuts, you get a $50 bonus, but more like, Kevin, that was so thoughtful of you. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about this. So it, that took, what, five seconds to celebrate? Those sorts of, you know, what, as any uh, parent or pet owner will tell you, what gets rewarded gets repeated. So so that's a, a great way to incentivize it and, and normalize it. One of the things that you talk about, which I agree with a great deal, and uh, is the, the importance of expectations, <clears throat> which certainly we were just sort of talking about in a way um, in relationship to those those five pieces. But uh, you have a set of questions about uh, that we ought to ask ourselves if we're going to be collaborating to set clearer expectations. We have clearer expectations. It will help the relationship grow. But there's one of the questions that I just love. And no, I'm not going to ask you to tell me what question eight was, but I am going to read question eight because I think it's so powerful. And so I'd love for you to just comment on it. So question eight is what level of polish would you like us to work toward? Is this a get it done or make it perfect situation? That's a really good question. It's a really important concept. Yeah. You want to talk to that a little bit? Absolutely. And I should say, I've got a, a handout that has all of these questions on it separate from the books. So I'm happy to make that available um, if we could put it in the show notes. I'll tell you, this one came from my many years as a professor in the classroom assigning group work and realizing that some of the students, they were there to get A++ work done. Anything short of spectacular was short of their expectations. And there were also students who were like, I'm here for an elective. This is not my major course. This is not something I need to shine on. In fact, this is a, I just need to get by by the skin of my teeth so I can focus on my other priorities and commitments. And I realized, wow, if we were just to have upfront conversations about what are your hopes, your dreams, your expectations around this particular project vis-a-vis -vis project or polish, we would be able to bypass a lot of the frustrations and pain of group work. It's not that I'm gonna actually there's a great, I have a great story about somebody who does assign people um, based on their their instinct there. But in my case, I didn't move people out of the groups if they um, you know had different level or different expectations, but I said, okay, design your work in a way that the person with the lower expectations is adding value to the project first so that the person with the higher expectations can add their value and their polish a little bit later. So that, that's where that originated from. And then talking to a consultant friend of mine in the UK, she said, yeah, we call this, are you looking for a mini or for a Mercedes Benz is how she describes it uh, as another nice metaphor about what really are we after here? Yeah, because I, I, I like that part of, uh, is it a get it done? Like, you know, I, I often will say, um, you know, good is good enough. But even on my own team, we will describe, well, what is good then, right? Like, because it just raises this question, like, and I just love the idea, the, the, the framing of how much polish do we need? And I, and, and I don't think in the workplace, it's always the same, right? But sort of yeah. having that as a starting point, like, I have coached many leaders who have asked for something from a team and kind of hoped for something, you know, back of the envelope estimation and got a 12 page, 30 minute PowerPoint. And here, I mean, here's the thing. None of us are mind readers. So if we don't tell people what's in our mind, they're going to guess. And some of us are super anxious and we're going to over guess and spend our entire weekend writing that 30 page uh, or that 30 slide presentation yeah. for you, which means we're not relaxing, spending time with our families, doing the things that will help us be more whole and healthy for the work. And so one of the ways we can and absolutely- what I wanted was an index card, right? Yeah, it's like we could totally take care of each other by saying what's on my mind. And if I really am looking for the, the 30 slide deck thing, I'm also gonna have the conversation as the leader of what else can I, um, can we back burner for a while for you to give you the capacity to do this extra thing? And uh, yeah, so important. Um, you wrote this in the book and I love it. So I'm just going to read this real quick. And I just want you to, it, it could stand on its own 
as it does in the book. But if you want to add anything to it, please do. Uh, you said we often get so busy with our own stuff that we neglect to pay attention to the needs of those with whom we work. Our collaborative relationships suffer as a consequence. Anything you, you know, want to add? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just, for those of you who, in the room who listen to many of Kevin's shows, I'll pull back to the microstressors conversation from that was published this week. And this idea that, you know, we impose burden on other people without realizing it. And that's true, you know, in the workplace in general. It's absolutely true in our collaborations, where if we're not conscientious, if we don't do what we say we're going to do, Somebody else has to pick up that slack. And I think that's a jerky thing to do, quite frankly. And it's not that I'm saying, oh, you should never uh, fail to, to fulfill a task because life happens. But when you see that coming, look around the corner and say, what is the impact on somebody else here? And what what's what can I do to mitigate that, that impact for them? Often it's as simple as the email, Kevin. So sorry to have to share this news. There's no way I'm getting this thing done. Here are the steps I can take to follow up on that or to bring you more capacity, or I'm going to go talk to the client now um, to let them know that, that it's going to be delayed, whatever it is, but take ownership, take action, take responsibility. Yeah. And the sooner we do that, the better, obviously, in terms of helping our trust levels. Um, so here, here's the, the farm boy from Michigan likes uh, North Platte, Nebraska girl, uh, in part because we're using words like jerky and stuff. So uh, I, I just love it. I, don't, I really do. Don't, um, yeah, I probably wanted get, to put something other than stuff in there. And the editor probably told me I was I, not allowed to. Stuff was perfect. Uh, <laughs> so we could talk a lot about the interdependence piece, but I'm, I'm looking at our time and, and we, I want to get to sort of the big idea of the matrix, right? Uh, the Mashik matrix, uh, and it's the it's the connection between relationship quality and interdependence. So talk about this uh, a little bit, and then I and then I really want to get to how do we use it. Yeah, yeah. So again, have a handout on this. I'm happy to share. So the Mashik matrix. We talked about relationship quality and interdependence. So now envision those as two different dimensions in a two by two matrix. When you have high relationship quality and high interdependence, that is a beautiful place to be collaborating. I like to say this is where the glitter encrusted unicorns fly through the sky, where I know you, I like you, I believe you're competent. You do what you say you're going to do. I benefit from your incredible competence and we're communicating well. That's a glorious place to be. So I call that collaborate. Great. When you have high interdependence, but low relationship quality, that's what I call collaborate hate. It's that I don't trust you. I don't think you're competent. I don't know you. I don't know what you value. I don't know what you're off doing. And whether I like it or not, I my outcomes, whether they're social outcomes, how other people are seeing me, my opportunities for promotion, my the way the client looks at us, our bonuses perhaps are tied in together. I, I my outcomes suffer because of you, and it feels miserable. This is where you know the the demons are like grabbing at your grabbing at your heels. That's when I'm taking stress home with me. That's when I start looking at other job opportunities um, because I need to get out of that situation so I can be healthier as a person, as a team member, as uh, as an employee. So uh, uh, many people who are listening uh, have probably heard of the Bruce Tuckman model Forming, storming, norming, and performing. Uh, and when people when people think about collaborate hate, which is which is uh, high interdependence but low relationship quality, how would you connect that to storming? So, I mean, is I, it? Connect, I'm not I'm not trying to make you make a connection that isn't. Yeah. There. No. Here's my thing. I think some people would say, "Oh, that's storming," but I I don't think it needs to be because here here's the thing that I think a lot of groups forget. And this is kind of the, how do we use it? You don't, or I don't think you should start a team by creating highly interdependent work before you've had a chance to develop a relationship. So the key advice from the book is invest first in relationship quality. So you don't ever have to do that storming, oh, we're fighting, you know, we're not getting along and this is just growing pains. It doesn't have to be like that. If you invest in 
getting to getting to know each other, um, setting those clear expectations, communicating the boundaries, communicating my hopes, my dreams, what, what's in it for me? What's in it for you? How can I help you be successful? What is this? So those are all relational things that we should do before we create the interdependencies in the work, which is one of the, I think, key insights from the model is the pathway from collaborate to collaborate goes, it, it's kind of counterintuitive. You can't just, oh, well, improve relationship quality because psychologically the heart doesn't let us do that. If we don't like somebody and we're totally armored and like protected from them because they're going to hurt us, it's really hard to just open yourself up to the risk of, oh, well, now we'll be bestie friends. Um, so if you're in a space of collaborate, you need to first create more independence. So you need to decrease the interdependence. Then you work on increasing relationship quality. Then you bring more of that interdependence back. And so I, I don't know if that totally answers your question, but I don't, I don't love the, the storming idea. I kind of had a feeling that you yeah. would, but I wanted to make the connection yeah. because I think that made for a rich conversation. Yeah. And, the, and the thing is that even if you are a, a big Tuckman model person, right? Even, even they would say, like, if we can get the relationships and the roles and all that figured out, like the better job we do in forming, the, sl- the faster we can get through storming, which isn't completely different from what you're saying. Uh, but the part that I love about what you're saying is if we can really get the relationship quality, and that isn't just I like you, that's clear expectations and clear processes and all that figured out before we start jumping into the work too quickly, we've got a much better chance of making it work. Is that a fair way? Yeah, this is totally one of those situations where go slow to go fast and do that hard work up front of establishing all of those people, tools and processes pieces that we need to enrich in the work that we're going to do together. So let me ask this question. Um, The world has, I don't know if you noticed, Deb, but in the last three years, we had this pandemic thing. uh, And a lot of people worked in different places than they ever worked before. And they joined new teams and they never met those people and, you know, all that stuff. Um, how How is collaboration changing or how is our expectation of collaboration changing? Yeah, so my, uh, Here's my hot take on the remote collaboration thing. The principles that undergird effective remote collaboration or effective hybrid collaboration are exactly the same as those that undergird effective in-person collaboration. What's different is how we manifest those principles. So you still need relationship quality. Does that mean you can do the water cooler conversations or the the quick go out for coffee? Um, You know, you happen to be in the elevator together and decide to go to the same cafe. Nope, it's going to look different. It's going to need some intentionality where we're actually going to let, let's schedule a, a 30 minute coffee chat. I don't, I don't know you yet, Kevin. Do you mind if we just do a, a get to know? Um, it's intentional in the way of the, the leader during onboarding saying, you know, one of our expectations during your onboarding is to have a coffee date with every single other person in, you know, in this area or on this team. Um, but it's almost, I think, in my mind, what the pandemic did when we all made that, not all, when many of us made that dramatic shift you know, in March, 2020 is, is kind of like when you're at the bar and all of a sudden it's last call and those lights, those glaring fluorescent lights get kicked on at the bar and you realize like how disgusting the bar has been all along. There's like somebody passed out in the corner over there and the, the bar is all sticky and gross. How do you know all of this, Deb? There's a question. (laughs) I've been there. I have so been there. I was like, oh my God, this is disgusting. It was there all along, but what the pandemic did was shine the harsh light on the poor relationships, poor practices that were kind of like papering over and holding us together to get some semblance of collaboration going because there were plenty of teams that did exceptionally well on that transition from in-person to remote because they had high interdependence, high relationship quality. They had their tools, they had their processes, people honored them. So, you know, this, some people, I, I haven't had a chance to read your book, but my guess is you're not saying all, all remote teams are doomed or anything like that, oh, but there are ways to do it well, right? So in 2018, before we had, and when Corona was still a beer, um, <laughs> we wrote in the long distance leader that uh, think leadership first, location second. And you're saying mm-hmm. think collaboration first, location second, which I would agree with 100, 100%. 
Well, um, how about we do it? Think collaborative leadership first. Location. There you go. Second. There, you, there go. you go. I like that. And and now everybody, if you got nothing else today, you got the uh, the last call syndrome for collaboration on your teams. Um, so so we've sort of been talking about this in general, but we've also we've made some comments for leaders specifically as we went. But before we really start to wrap up, uh, anything else you would say? I mean, about about the leader's role. In other words thinking about this in third person, like how do I build a collaboration on my team and not just my role in that as a, as a team member, anything else specifically for leaders that you want to point us to or help it, have us think about? Yeah, I would, the big one for me is what I call the dysfunction awareness problem. So just because you're not aware of a problem doesn't mean you don't have a problem. It's the same way of you think your roof is fine and then all of a sudden it starts leaking. I tell you that roof was degrading for a long time before you saw the leak. And so what I would like more leaders to be attuned to are those leading indicators of a collaboration problem. So there are the downstream things that I think we all know where the timeline got busted or uh, there was a really angry client that felt totally not taken care of, or we happen to be looking on trust pilot and see that all of our customers feel like they're passed around. You know, they can never get anything answered. Those, those are your lagging indicators of a collaboration problem. Your leading indicators that I would love more people to be paying attention to are the relational dynamics. Do people seem to enjoy being around each other? Do you see evidence of trust, of being willing to challenge each other? Um, or do you see a lot of nodding and pleasant yeses? Because if you have, if everyone's just, uh-huh, uh-huh, that's great. Yeah, go ahead, get along. They're likely going up, going home and just complaining, um, you know, to at home and behind backs and whatnot. So so I, I'm a big believer in assessment too. There are some really easy ways that we can evaluate how what the collaborative relationship quality is on our teams. So value this collaboration thing enough to put the resources in place to do it well. Perfect. Now I'm going to shift gears before we finish. Uh, and longtime listeners know what I'm going to, uh, what the questions are that come next. Uh, the first one is this, what do you do for fun, Deb? Ah, oh, so many things. I'm really excited as we turned the season into summer to finally get back on my paddleboard, to get down to the bonfires, to get down to the live jams around the bonfires. Uh, I just got my garden in last week, so I'm excited about that. I play bridge. I'm learning how to play bass. I do ceramics. So I, I, uh, I do lots of things. I wish I had more time to do all the things. I love that. Um, the only thing you knew I was going to ask you uh, is what are you reading or what's something you, you said you finished, just finished something recently. Yeah. I just finished a, a book on the plane the other day called give smart. And it's for philanthropists um, who are interested in having more impact. It's by Tom Tierney and Joel Fleischman. And what I loved about this book is it takes key business principles where businesses obviously are governed by, by marketplace and whatnot, but it says, what if we use that same rigor the same sort uh, to, to do philanthropy better. So it's really about how you do research and relationship building and bring rigor to giving. So I, I'm using it with some of my consulting clients who happen to be in the philanthropic space. Perfect. And now the question that you hoped I would ask, which is where can we learn more about you, about your work, about the book? Like, where do you want to, you mentioned some resources, you make sure you get those to us and we'll make sure those are in the show notes, but where else do you want to point people? Where can we learn more? Where can we get a copy of this? Yeah, yeah. Or, so or easiest movie? place is to go to debmashek.com. And there you can, if you're interested, jump in on my newsletter. It's just a, a twice a month sort of thing because I don't want to flood people. But I am very intentional about giving concrete tips and tricks. And uh, while you're there, you could go to the resources page, has something like 90 free resources at this point. So every article I've ever published or uh, on these topics, it's all there for free. And I love, love, love being in conversation with people. So join the conversation on LinkedIn. All right. And that would be D-E-B-M-A-S-H-E-K.com. Or you can go to her consulting website as well, myco-consulting.com, right? Or you could go to collaborate.com. There are so many choices, but yeah. Can I tell you, as soon as I found that that URL was still available, totally sealed the deal on the book's title. Collaborate.com, everybody. Uh, so now, everybody, I have a question for you before we finish. And the question that I have for you is now what? 
what action are you going to take? If you came here uh, as a regular listener, uh, hopefully you got some value. If you came here specifically because you want to work on collaboration, I'm confident you got some value. But none none of you will get nearly as much value from just listening than if you take some action. So whether it's thinking about working on communal norms or whether it's thinking about setting up clearer expectations with others or whether it's thinking about what do we need to do to intentionally build, in general, build relationship quality in our organizations or for me myself with those that I need to collaborate more with. What is it that you take from this that you will take action on? Because until you take action, not much is really going to change. Deb, thanks so much for being here. It was such a pleasure to have you. I enjoyed our conversation immensely. Yeah, my pleasure. And a pleasure to, to hang out a little bit and have this conversation. I appreciate the opportunity. And everybody, uh, if you love this, make sure you invite someone to come listen to this, but also to come join us next week. You know we're here every week. Wherever you happen to be watching or listening to us, you can like, you can refer, you can all those things. Review, do all those things, and make sure you come back next week for another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We'll see you then.